Hey folks, my name is Gene, and this video is the first one in a series that is going to show you uh, about my print NC uh, CNC machine project. Um, this video is being done to help those folks out that are interested in the machine and that don't want to go to a whole pile of different videos to get fragments of, of information that they need. I'm gonna try to make this a one-stop shop if I can. Uh, that being said, I'm probably gonna miss that mark. Um, if you are new to CNC, I strongly recommend that you read up on it and understand what it can do, what it can't do, and how you can use it in your own projects. It's not a miracle maker. It's just a tool that'll help you do really interesting things really quickly and really accurately. That being said, we're gonna get started on this. I've got notes here that are just talking points. I don't have one of those fancy teleprompters because, well, it would sound really weird if I was reading from something right now. And uh, I'm too cheap to buy one. So, and I don't wanna build one either. So here we go. So, to give you an idea as to where I'm coming from with this, uh, a few weeks ago I was uh, doing some maintenance on my shop bot in order to get it cleaned up and, and lubed up in that because I was going to start working on a project that I had in mind. And during that process, I remembered, or rediscovered actually, uh, an issue with that style of machine. Um, the rails that are on the X and Y gantries, and I'll insert a picture right there, maybe? We'll see. Um, of what that rail looks like. And it's mild steel. Well, the ShopBot uses hardened steel V-rollers. Again, picture of the V-roller. And as a result, the rollers won't wear, but the rails will. And the rails are ground to a 45 degree angle uh, at the top. So it kind of looks like, yay, it's actually 90 degrees, but you get what I'm talking about. And over time, that hardened steel V-roller pushes the steel down, okay? Um, and I'll see if I can't put a picture of that there. So. What happens is, over time, it's wearing this rail down. Well, a lot of the stuff that I do in the shop bot occurs within like the first couple of feet of the machine bed, okay? So that first couple of feet gets wore a lot more than the rest of the machine. And the result isn't that much. I mean, over 17 years, of the, or 16 or 17 years that I've had the machine, it's probably only a few thousandths difference from one end of the rail to the other. The problem is, is that I wanna start getting into more uh, metalworking stuff, machining aluminum. The ShopBot can do it, but I don't want that kind of error in the parts that I make because a few thousandths difference in a metal part can be the difference between it fitting and it not fitting whatever it's attaching to. So I kind of had in my head, I need to figure out what I'm going to do. I either need to get uh, a hardened rail kit, which essentially right, it sits right on top of the, uh, the old rail and it's bolted to the, the angle for both the X and the Y gantries, or I find another machine that's more suitable towards uh, machining aluminum or steel or things like that. And I just kind of shoved it off the side of my mind. I'll worry about it later. And I don't know, two or three days later, I was surfing Reddit, as one does. And one of my subreddits that I enjoy looking at is Hobby CNC, which is right there. And I noticed a, a, an article posted by a guy that is building a print NC machine that had never heard of the machine before. So I went ahead and started looking, I watched his video and it was interesting, but it lacked a lot of detail. So 
I went back to the beginning of his stuff and watched everything, and it covered a lot. It was good stuff, but there were holes everywhere, okay? Um, and not necessarily a bad thing, because if you're into the project and you're doing it, you don't think of these things, okay? But somebody that's coming into it from nothing that has only heard of it a few hours prior, it's like, well, what about this or what about that? And I ended up in this rabbit hole of print NC videos, collecting bits and pieces to fully understand what I was potentially getting myself into. And at that point, I was able to, to learn what I needed to learn and went, okay, this is something I really want to pursue because it's a heavy machine. It's all made out of steel. There's no uh, structural plastic parts or anything else like that. And it's got a serious drive system. It's not a belt drive. It's not threaded rod. It's not Acme screw. It actually uses precision ground ball screws. And when I get to the unboxing, you'll see those. Um, I would consider the, the, the print NC DIY project to fall in the, the prosumer class. And I say that because the machine is designed to do a task without necessarily worrying about how much it's going to cost. Um, all the other machines that are out there that other people would class as, as prosumer, um, like the Shapeoko or others, um, they're good to a point, but then you start seeing the cost reductions uh, in things like drive system choices and stepper choices and controller choices and things like that. Um, and those are also, uh, you know, they're, I mean, they're commercial products. You buy it, you slap a few pieces together, and you start making sawdust or whatnot. Um, the print NC machine is about as DIY as you can get, short of mining your own ore and forging your own steel. Um, you're going to start out with a pile of steel, which I'll show in a second, and a couple of boxes of parts and you gotta go from there. The good news is, is if you can follow instructions and you can use a drill bit to make holes, um, you'll be able to build this thing. Learning how to use it, eh, that's gonna take some work. Um, this is not a little toy machine like the 3018s you can get on Amazon for a couple of hundred bucks. This is a serious CNC machine. Um, the version I'm building uses a 2.2 kilowatt water-cooled spindle, which will eat you if you get too close to it and that cutter catches you. Um, and it's not going to slow down. So you have to be aware of, of the dangers around a CNC machine. And that goes for all CNC machines, not just this particular project. Um, what else was I going for here? And my power just blinked and everything reset. Damn it. Now I have to go turn on my, oh, and it shut the power or shut the heat off. Okay. I'll be back. Where am I at? <sighs> so another benefit of the, the print NC project is that it's completely open source. Uh, the gentleman that created it is in Australia. I cannot remember his name to save my life. Um, his uh, nick on the Discord is Hodges, H-O-G-E-S-A-U. It'll There'll be a link in, in the description about all this stuff that I'm talking about. Um, the Print NC project is open source, um, which means you don't have to buy the plans to build the machine. You just go to the the three design website, which that will be a link below. Uh, and you can grab the Fusion 360 model. Uh, the entire machine is built in Fusion 360 and it's a parametric model. And that means that um, you can adjust the tolerances, not the tolerances, the, the sizes of the material used in the machine to match what you buy, okay? Uh, for example, the, the whole machine is basically, it's metric. The guys from Australia, you're going to use metric. 
Um, but here in the States, they don't specify steel uh, sizes in metric. So what you have to do is you have to get a pair of calipers and go through and you measure your steel and you put those values into the, the parametric uh, values area of the model and it will, adjust, it will adjust all the things that interface with those parts to make sure everything fits. Um, and that's a really cool, interesting thing that I don't think I've ever seen anybody do before, at least not in this kind of a machine. Um, another benefit is that you're guaranteed good fits on all the plastic parts that you have to print. And there's not a whole lot of plastic in this thing because, again, this thing is made out of steel, it's heavy, it's made to, to just hog through stuff, okay? Uh, so none of the, the, the real structural components are plastic. It's mostly aligning things, end caps, things like that. I think the only part I would consider to be a critical component that's in plastic is the, uh, the end cap that contain, or holds the, the ball screw nut. And one of the first things a lot of people do when they, when they finish their machine build is to make replacements out of aluminum for those. Um, in fact, most of the people I've seen with these machines do that. You don't have to, you can. So, where am I at now? Uh, we did drive systems and all that fun thing. We talked about it being prosumer. This is just awesome stuff. I don't know if I'm going to edit this out or not. Day to day to day. Yeah, so one of the interesting things about the machine is that you're the final arbiter of how much it's going to cost um, past a certain point, okay? Uh, depending on where you live in the world, your steel cost is going to vary wildly. Um, I am building the default size of the machine, which has a work area of 670 by 610 millimeters. It's about 38 by 24 inches. Um, and my default steel ran me about $447 from a local supplier. And I had them cut it all to length because it wasn't something I wanted to mess with. But I've probably got 125, 130 pounds of steel here, which I'll, I'll show you here in a second. Um, but I've seen people build out their machines for as low as $200 in steel. It all depends where you're at and with the nonsense Russia has pulled recently and it's affecting everything and yada, yada, yada. You know how it goes. Um, the other kind of fixed cost, well, it's not really fixed because it depends on how, your, how large your machine is and your controller and voltage choices, okay? Um, the uh, three design store has a tool on it that will allow you to put in all the parameters for your machine or, and how you want to build it. And that will do two things for you. It'll give you a cut list of steel that you'll need to take to your local steel vendor to get your materials. And it will uh, kick off a quote process from the vendor that supplies uh, all the motion system components, uh, your spindle and things like that. Um, you're getting it through AliExpress. Uh, I wouldn't worry about uh, the, the, the safety of doing that. There's a lot of people buying these kits from this same vendor uh, and they haven't had any problems. Yeah, sometimes it can take a while to get here. But I ordered on or my parts on, I think, March 18th and everything showed up uh, this past Saturday, which, I th which is, I think, uh, April 8th. Uh, and the, the vendor is very communicative in letting you know what's going on at least in my case they were. Um, also understand that the guy that did the machine and the guy that runs the website is not the vendor for the parts. He has partnered with another company in China. Um, at any rate, so you've got a base cost for the machine in your steel and your basic motion components, okay? You can choose your spindle voltage being 110 or 220. They recommend 220 if you can do it. And they don't recommend a spindle smaller than 2.2 kilowatt or uh, yeah kilowatts, which is what my system is going to be. You also have a VFD or a, a variable frequency drive 
that is part of that package. And that um, is what controls the spindle, the spindle speed. I think that's just about it for the basics. Um, there's a very extensive wiki that folks have been putting together. And you're going to want to hit that, and I'll put the, the link to that in the description, because it's going to have detailed instructions about what this series of videos is going to show you. Um, so that being said, let's go ahead and start doing the unboxing of the stuff that I got that I have, it's just been killing me. I haven't been able to look in the boxes yet because I wanted to do this video. So let's go ahead and get into that and uh, we'll see what I got. Okay, so we got two boxes here. One of these boxes has the ball screws in it and one of these boxes has the linear rail in it. Um, so let's see how we get these open. I want to preserve the boxes because it's going to be some time before I'm able to actually get to use them. But, oof. I should note that the ball screws come with a oil coating from the factory. This is not lubrication. This is, let's not let it rust while it's in shipping oil. These have got to be lubricated properly. Um, using only that oil is not proper lubrication. So just be aware of that. I'm probably preaching to the choir about some of this stuff, so. Okay, maybe this is linear rail, I don't know. We've got some. Oof. Okay, yeah, I bet this is linear rail. And it's not light at all. Okay, so I'll put that box aside. And let's see what we got here. It looks to have a cap on the end of it. See that? Um, yeah. Twist that off, maybe? There we go. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, this is the linear rail. Yeah, this is the linear rail for the Z-axis. Um, and I'll leave one out of this oil everywhere, so, because they're packed to not get rusty in ship. Ah, did not want to do that. So here we have a precision ground Z-axis rail. So we need to put that back in the package. And I'm not going to open the other two. You've seen one high precision ground rail. You've seen the rest of them. <laughs> they do seem to be well packed though. Um, there were concerns that I've seen from folks about poor packing. Uh, that is not in evidence here which makes me feel good. So I'm gonna set that aside over there. And we'll just kind of roll this one over, get it out of the way. So those are the linear rails, which leads me to believe that this big box here contains the uh, ball screws. A bend to it, okay, so. I don't know how well you can see that, but this box contains, uh, it looks like our linear uh, carriages. And ball screw, I bet. So we'll just open one of these. Again, I don't want to tear into all this stuff because I'm a couple of weeks away, I think, from actually needing it. And uh, I don't want to, uh, to mess with the stuff at the moment. So let's see what we got here. 
This is a ball screw. And this is for the Z-axis. Looks like it's sealed on one end. Is it sealed on both ends? It is, it is sealed on both ends. So we'll have to fix that. And there is our Z-axis ball screw. Probably see that better over here in this camera. Oh, that is just smooth. And there's zero backlash in that at all. This is why the ball screw is, is good for CNC machines because there is zero backlash in them. Um, and backlash is something that will happen when you change directions. Uh, it takes up slop in the mechanism. Well, there is no slop. I will warn you now, do not take the nut off the screw. If you do, the balls in here will come out and you will never get them back in. Um, it's my understanding that they use a special jig in order to uh, assemble these things. You do not have that jig. Um, another thing here is on the side, and I believe this is what it is. This is a, a six millimeter hole for a Zerk fitting for uh, injecting lithium grease into it to keep it lubricated. Again, as I mentioned previously, this is not lubricated. This is just packing oil to keep it from rusting. You will need to put your own Zerk fittings in here and you will need to lubricate the, the ball screws. Get that put back together. And I will open one of the, the linear rail carriages so you can see what that looks like. Back in the tube with you. <laughs> So we've got, and there's, I also bought hardware with mine. So there's a lot of hardware involved in the kit uh, and that's included in this box as well. Um, this bag has one of the linear, linear carriages in it. So let's go ahead and get one of those opened up. So you guys can see what that looks like. And that's got, an extra bit in here. Oh, that's a ball screw end nut. I think that's what that is. Oh, these are the these are the blocks. Okay, these are the blocks. So this is the thing that the ball screw threads into on one end. Okay. So that's what that's all about. So I suspect in one of these other bags is the uh, the linear guides that ride on the linear rails. Um, but I don't want to open some of these other things up right now to chase that down. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna clean up this mess and we're gonna go to the box that's got all the other goodies in it. Okay, so we got that handled. I need more coffee. Okay, let's see what we have. Ooh, smashed. Oh yeah. Lots of broken foam. Lots and lots of broken foam. Okay, so. We're gonna end up doing a lot of this on the other camera because that box is gonna block it. So let's see what we got here. And if I can get through this entire thing without cutting myself, I'll be thrilled. Oh, okay, here. This is a NEMA 23 stepper motor. Okay, this is what does all the work. You can see the part number there if you're interested. It's a four wire stepper. And one of the options that you have when you're putting your machine together, and I don't know if the, uh, the vendor 
that sells these parts offers them, but you can get uh, uh, servo drives that are much better to have. But again, it's not a, you absolutely have to have it. It's a nice to have. Okay, this box is, I think this is a 36 volt power supply. Yeah, it's a 36 volt power supply. This is for the stepper motors. Um, my understanding is, is that you can drive them as high as 60 volts. Um, this looks like a male to female DB25 cable. Uh, that's kind of strange. It's an A to A USB cable. We have oh, E chain for running cabling in. And I think, I don't know if these things come apart or not. I think they do. I think these, these links here, they come apart or lift out so you can run cabling in them easier, more easily. Uh, there's one for X and one for Y. There are mounts that you need to print for these things. So then we've got our other separate motors. There are four motors total. We have one for the Z axis and we have uh, two for X and one for Y. Um, this is a linear bearing block. Oh, look, and it comes with a Zerk fitting too. Look at that. That's handy. Because these, again, have to be lubricated. They're not. So this is what rides on those linear rails. Um, and again, it's got packing oil on it. That's a really nice piece of chunk and kit there. Um, needs to be cleaned up a little bit. It's an HG20 style, it looks like. So you'll notice it's got this, this piece in here, okay? Well, this is basically holding the, the ball bearings on the inside, and you wanna leave that in there, okay? Um, when it's time for you to mount this on the rail, leave it in there and then slide it onto the rail, and it will push this out as uh, the carriage gets on the rail. And then hang on to it, because if you ever need to remove this from the rail, you need to make sure that you're reinserting it as you're pulling it off the rail, because that'll keep all of the ball bearings in place. Okay, so that's one of them. There's two. Three. Four, five. And six of those, it looks like. Yeah, six of those. And these look to be uh, more uh, end blocks for the uh, ball screws. Okay, so now we go to the next layer. See what's in the next layer. Ooh, okay. Getting interesting things. This is the manual for the VFD. This is what controls the spindle motor. And in there we've got this tubing is for the spindle. The spindle is water cooled. Um, and there's miscellaneous hose fittings, it looks like, in here. Oh, and this is a water pump for that. A lot of folks use a, uh, a five gallon bucket as their water pump reservoir. Okay, this is called the Bob or the breakout board. Um, this is the default electronics that come with this kit. If you're gonna be a, a, a Linux CNC user, or if that's your thing, fine, no worries, you can use this. 
Um, I am using a different board that I will show you here. This is just not coming out of here, is it? There we go. So there's the breakout board. And that's what you plug your stepper drivers into. It's kind of a neat little thing. We'll put that, and that explains the, the need for the, uh, the A to A cable because it's got a USB A port here instead of the, the larger B port. Okay, so we'll set that there. We have a thing on the submersible pump, which I'm assuming that thing is. And then, come on. This is the VFD. Kind of a neat looking little beastie. See? I won't get into specifics of this right now, but. This is what makes the spindle spindle. And then, wow, there's even more goodies in here. Okay, so we have, these are uh, position sensors. This is what allows the machine to know when it's getting close to an end stop. And this is important because uh, the firmware that I'm going to be using called GerbilHow uh, will allow me to auto square uh, the system using sensors like this. Um, then we've got a bunch of ER20 collets. Yeah, and they're listed, but yeah, there we go. This is the different sizes of ER20 collets you get with it. You're going to want to get more. Um, simply because you'll use them. Um, let's see here. There's another sensor. So we've got, what, two, four, five sensors. Um, this is the motor mount. You will need to drill this yourself on this flange here. Um, there's instructions and, plan and, and a little paper thing you can put over this to properly punch and drill that. And then these are the, the links that link the uh, stepper motors to the ball screw ends. Uh, there's more miscellaneous hardware in here it looks like. And little plastic caps to cover the uh, bolt holes in the tops of the hardened steel rails. And then, I think this is the last piece in here. Holy shit, this thing is heavy. This is the spindle. It's water-cooled, 220 volts, 2.2 kilowatt. Max draw is 8 amps, and it does 24,000 RPM. So, yeah, that's a chonky boy, isn't it? <laughs> I noticed that the, the connector up here is different than from what I've seen in that, that it's a much heavier gauge connector uh, than I've seen other folks build. So this might be an update to that, to that spindle. But yeah, this is a beastie. I don't know what 2.2 kilowatts trans translates into horsepower. The spindle on my shop bot is a 2.2 horsepower uh, made by uh, HSD. So yeah. And if you look here, you can see that little that little drill spot. That means that this collet nut is balanced, and uh, that's actually a good thing. Anytime you you're working with something that's spinning it up to 24,000 RPM. You want to make sure all the pieces are as balanced as they can get because unbalanced components lead to vibration and vibration leads to failures. Okay, so 
that's it for the stuff that comes in that kit. Um, next, we're going to move on to the stuff that I bought off of Amazon and some other places. These are all the metal components for the size of the machine I'm building. Again, I went through the calculator and I just used the default values that it showed. Um, the calculator will do both metric and imperial, AKA freedom units. <clears throat> and uh, these are all the parts that you're gonna end up with, okay? You're gonna have two pieces of steel for your Y roller, okay? And you'll notice here that I've written what the dimension is. Uh, this is a little bit oversized, but that's okay. Um, it can be a little bit longer. The important part is, is that this cut face is exactly square uh, because uh, this is where uh, the cap goes that holds the ball screw nut, okay? You can have a little bit of variation if you're using plastic, but if you go to the aluminum carrier, you have got to have this 100% square, okay? Um, and you only need one side square because this side does not have any mechanical interconnect to it, okay? And there's two of these. Um, this is the X roller, same deal. You have to have at least one uh, square face to it. This one is at 92 millimeters. It should be 90, so they overcut a little bit. The problem is, is that it is uh, not square, okay? There's a little bit of a gap there, and if I put it down, you hear that clicking? It's, it's leaning up. And uh, both sides have that problem. But when I put two faces of this together, they're good. There's no bounce there. There's nothing there. And there's nothing there. And I've actually checked these two with uh, some machine to squares that I bought to make sure that they were 100% square in those cuts. If they're not, you're gonna to have to come up with a way to cut it uh, square yourself, either by using a, a, an angle grinder or uh, a sanding wheel or something, but you'll need to make that square. When you buy your steel, if you explain to the, uh, the vendor that you buy from that you absolutely need to get square edges or square cuts because you're building a CNC machine you know, that, and, and I mean, be nice about it and it, just explain to them that, you know, I know you guys are, are busy and you got a lot of going on, but if you could take a little bit extra care to make sure that these are square cut, um, it'll save you a lot of grief. And if they want to charge you a little bit extra to, to do that square cut, you know, let them do it. It's, believe it or not, it's going to be worth it for you in the end, uh, the end, because you do not want to grind one of these things down, uh, with a, a flap disc or something like that. It's just a pain in the ass and it's hard to do, uh, to get it correct. Especially if you don't have any extra. I made sure that all of these got cut just a little bit extra because I didn't have the forethought to, hey, to say, hey, please cut these square. So anyway, this is all the steel. There are the Y rollers, the X roller, okay? And these go on either end of the x gantry. Um, these are the Y supports. There's two of those. This is the X support. And there's three of these, okay? And then this piece here is the X gantry. Um, these are cut to 900 millimeters each. This one is 1300. This is 1327, and that's long. It should be 1325. That's okay, I can shave that two millimeters off without any problem, because I've got the tools for it. And then the X supports are also, there's, there's three of those and they're 1300 millimeters. The aluminum parts you're gonna get, you need to get an aluminum angle, okay? Um, I believe it's 6061 T54, that does not have a radius on this inside edge here. And that's very important because if it's got a radius, uh, 
or if the, the only material you can get has a radius, you're going to have to file it square because there's a, a component that fits in here that has got to be perfectly up against here and here. And you're only going to get that if, you, if there's no radius here. Um, anyway, this is quarter inch uh, material. When it's cut down, it'll be three inches uh, by two. Now, how long is that supposed to be? Let's see here. I've got my, my cheat sheet here where I write everything down to make sure that I don't forget anything. Um, 90 millimeters. So this is a three by two extrusion and I'm gonna cut it down to 90 millimeters, which probably means it's gonna fit in there somewhere like yay, I think. That's entirely probably wrong, so don't take my word for it. I haven't got that far in things yet. Um, I'm kind of explaining this to you folks as I go. Um, you've got two pieces of aluminum you have to get. Um, this is for the Z tramming plate. Um, if you're not aware of it, tramming is the, the process of guaranteeing that your spindle is perfectly perpendicular uh, to the machine bed. Uh, and that is important for getting accurate cuts. This piece is the Z-axis plate. Um, both of these pieces will have to be machined either on my shop bot or on the machine itself. Um, I say on the machine itself because, excuse me, because one of the, the tasks you can do is to make your Z-axis plate out of three quarter inch plywood and that will get the machine up and running. And then you can take this uh, plate here, this blank plate, put it in the machine and mill it, you know, face it, flip it over, face it again, and cut the holes and the features and things like that that you need. And then you swap out the wood with this plate. And then you'll do the same thing with this. You get your, Z, your, your trimming plate made and then install that. Okay, so on to the other miscellaneous things that I had to get. So Remember I was talking about the, the Zerk fittings. You're gonna need some of these. Um, before, uh, before I get into this, I should tell you that I am not going to tell you everything that you have to get. Um, there's detailed bills and materials on the wiki. And you know, if you ask questions in the Discord about, hey, well, what about this? Or, or this is what I have, do I need more? Folks will be happy to help you out. Um, the Discord for the Print NC project has probably been one of the most gracious and helpful Discords I've ever seen. Uh, and I've seen them deal with uh, one or two complete, just horrible people, and they did it with uh, amazing grace and integrity, and I was, I was very impressed. Anyway, so uh, the ball screws do not come with Zerk fittings, and that's what these are, okay? Uh, these are six millimeters with a 45 degree angle on them, and you'll need to get these installed, and this is how you, you'll grease your, your ball screw nuts. Um, one of the things you'll need to do is drill and tap all of your holes in all your steel. And for that, I recommend going this route. Um, it's, you know, buy it now, cry now, because this isn't cheap, but it's a good set of tools and it'll last you a while. This is all metric and there is the tap and it's an associated uh, clearance hole drill, okay? So if you're gonna make a, a 10 millimeter hole or a tap for a 10 millimeter hole, you use this drill bit and this tap, okay? Um, and then they've got other sizes. It goes from two and a half millimeters all the way up to 12 millimeters, which is real close to a half inch. Um, you will need wire. Uh, this is 18 gauge four conductor double uh, insulated or double shielded, I mean, which means it's wrapped with aluminum and it also has an internal shield wire. This is the wire that you'll use for your spindle. Spindles are very noisy. Um, this is the wire that you'll use for the stepper motors. Uh, it's four conductor, 22 gauge wire. It's perfectly capable of carrying the current that the steppers will pull. Um, Next, I'm gonna show you the stepper drivers, but I wanna show you an example of a different kind of stepper driver before I do that. So, pause. Okay, so, stepper drivers. I suspect that <clears throat> a lot of you that have dealt with 3D printers are used to seeing a stepper driver that looks something like this, okay? 
And this is a standard uh, TM series, I think, a separate driver that you would find on a 3D printer, okay? We are not dealing with little things like this anymore. The kind of stepper driver that you're going to end up with is something that looks like this, okay? This is a real honest-to-God, purpose-built, no screwing around stepper driver, okay? You can tell that these two things are not the same. They do similar jobs, but one does it in an industrial capacity and the one does it in a 3D printing capacity. Um, these were from Stepper Online. You can buy them either through the Stepper Online store or you can get them through Amazon. I bought these through Amazon and I think they were like 20, between 25 and $28 a piece. Um, these things are rated for, I think, 4.2 amps max and they can run up to 50 volts, uh, supply voltage. And they're configured by these charts here. And then there's dip switches here. And I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but that's basically what you're gonna end up with. Um, and you'll need four of these for your build. Um, I bought five because at some, at some point I am going to deal with a, or want to deal with a fourth axis which is basically just a rotary axis. Okay, that's that. Let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, power supply. So the next thing I'm gonna show you requires a 24 volt power supply. And this particular supply is, uh, it's a, a branded meanwhile 24 volt supply, but it's designed to mount onto a DIN rail, okay? And a DIN rail is basically a specially uh, formed piece of metal. And I'll show a picture of it here and edit. And this just clips right to that DIN rail. Um, it's really kind of a really slick system. So anyway, that's the power supply. That I also purchased off of Amazon. So and if you've been paying attention, you'll notice that the system requires two power supplies. Okay. That 24 volt power supply drives this next thing. This is called a contactor. A contactor is basically a really fancy word for a relay, okay? And that's what this is. It's a relay designed for industrial use with uh, designed to switch high amperage loads. This is what you put between your 220 volt or your 110 volt uh, input and the input on the VFD. So effectively, if this is not energized, neither is any power going to that motor. And the motor is your biggest draw in your whole system. And at the voltages it runs at, you don't want to mess with it. You want one of these. And I am probably explaining that very poorly. It is discussed very well in the wiki. So you want to, you'll want to look at that. Um, I mentioned earlier that the controller choice I went is not the breakout board that is included with the kit. Instead, I went with a thing called the Gerbil How 2000. Now, the Gerbil How 2000 is an open source project that runs a, uh, a port of uh, the firmware Gerbil uh, to really uh, much more powerful microcontrollers. As a result, it was renamed Gerbil How. This is what the Gerbil Howl 2000 board looks like. It is essentially a breakout board for a Teensy 4.1. Uh, the Teensy 4.1 is an absolute beast. Um, if memory serves, it cooks along at, at 600 megahertz and it's a fully 32-bit compliant CPU. Um, along here are the, inter are the connections for your stepper drivers. And along this edge, if memory serves is miscellaneous inputs, end stops, things like that. Um, you can control your VFD with it because it talks RS-485, which is the, the two-wire protocol that the uh, VFD uses for setting the RPM. Um, you can use this connector to connect it to a spindle sink for working with a lathe. You have two communications choices. You can use Ethernet or you can use serial. Uh, the benefit to this board above the, the breakout board or something like uh, the Mesa controller that's also mentioned is that all the heavy lifting is done here, okay? 
you'll use a, a program called a sender. And all that thing does is it throws G code at this board. The TNC does all the work of figuring out how to turn that G code into motion, okay? It also handles all of your uh, min-max inputs and things like that. Um, there's also some relay outputs on here, I think, for turning on misting systems, uh, flood coolant, fans, air. Uh, there's a door interlock switch, an, in, uh, an input probe for doing um, probing of objects or zero height on your, your machine bed, all kinds of stuff. I'll put a link in the description for this. It's an excellent board. Um, I found one uh, sold by one of the guys in the Discord, and it cost me 100 bucks, shipped, assembled, done, and came with all the connectors I needed to use. Um, I'm using pinned connectors for this, not the ribbon cable, but if dealing with ribbon cable is your more, more your speed, go for it. There's nothing wrong with doing it that way. Now, let's see what else I can come up with to show you guys. I think that's just about it. Um, what else am I missing? Ah, oh, 3D printed parts. Okay, so the first parts you're going to print after you get your steel in hand is this thing, okay? This is basically a calibration part to make sure that the parameters that you've measured on your steel parts are going to translate into an accurate and well-fitting component when you print it for real, okay? You'll notice that this thing fits in here with just a slap, okay? And that's a perfect fit. Um, it also fits, or not fits, but it, it shows you the fit on the outside as well. Watch me break it, let's try to get it off of there, on this edge, okay? So you want that good fit there. Um, and another feature it has, and I'll let you look this up in the wiki because I don't want to just repeat it, but using this middle bar, you can measure to the outside of the, uh, the uh, X-rail, 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 one of X, Y, something or other. I, it's been a long day, I'm tired, getting things wrong. It'll allow you to change the parameters for the motor mount to ensure that uh, the center line of the shaft of the stepper motor is perfectly in line with the center line of the shaft of the ball screw, which is important. Um, another thing you're going to want to print before you get to this is this. This is a radius gauge, okay? Um, steel you can get from anywhere. It's mostly standard in the States. It's mostly standard in Europe. But there's enough differences that you want to be able to check and make sure. Well, what you can do is put this on your steel and check to make sure that the radius that you think you have is the radius you actually have. Um, and they have a number of these. They come in different different radiuses. And I you know, printed some of them. Um, the other things that you're gonna print after this, okay, when, the, when, when this is doing exactly what it's supposed to do and you're happy with it, you've got 10 or 11 components that you're gonna print that are gonna be used as drill, dr drill jigs. This is one of them. Okay, I'm not sure, I don't recall off the top of my head as to where it goes, but what you're going to do is you're going to use a, a metric transfer punch that will fit in this hole. Uh, if you don't have a metric transfer punch, you can use a 1 8 inch transfer punch, but go ahead and, ru and run through that hole with a, an 8 inch drill bit by hand. Okay, that'll give you a good tight hole to mark in because what you're going to do is this goes on the end of your part like so, okay? And you're gonna hit the center of each one of these with that transfer punch. And then you're gonna come back with a regular uh, punch and hit it again, just to make sure that you've got the holes marked as effectively as you can. Um, and there's a whole, there's a number of these. Um, different shapes, depending on where they're going. Um, here's a larger one for marking the metal like that, okay? Um, then you have these things. These are alignment jigs for the linear rail. And effectively what you'll do is you'll clip 
a number of these along, you know, you print three or four of them, and you put those along your, uh, your rail, and then you could clamp your, uh, your linear rail down, and then right through the center there, using an, another a suitably sized transfer punch, mark your centers for all of your mounting screws for your linear rail. Um, and these will ensure that that rail is straight and correctly centered all the way down the piece of metal. Um, you'll also want to print one of these. This is a center gauge. Essentially what you're going to do is it fits like that and allows you to draw a straight line right down the center of your steel. Um, it's also a parametric part, so when you enter your steel long, your steel short, your steel radius, and your steel thick, you'll get perfect part that'll print guaranteed down the center of that steel. Um, this is something that I built, that I made myself. Um, I want to use this to help make sure that I've got my uh, transfer punch as perfectly perpendicular to the metal as I can make it because I don't want that tip wandering off from that hole. And effectively all you're going to do is, I don't know if I've got something handy I can, I, can, I don't, I'll just use a pencil. Essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold it like that. So when I'm working that hole, I'm holding this and it'll, you get the idea, okay? I tap it and move on to the next hole. It's a stupid simple thing, but it helps make sure that if you can't see it real well or you ha there's other issues, that it'll help you go ahead and get that, that thing as square as you can to that surface. Um, and I think that's just about it. I will go ahead and I'll post a link to this part um, so you can download that if you want. And I think for this video, I'm going to stop it there because it's really long. Some of you have probably died from boredom right now. The rest are probably developing alcohol problems. Um, <laughs> and I'm just going to cut it loose. Uh, I appreciate the time that you spent watching this. And uh, I look forward to producing following episodes that hopefully part, impart more information. If anybody has any questions, feel free to post them in the comments. Um, I will do my absolute best to respond to every comment unless it's insulting, in which case I'll just like mock you or something. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, folks, and I will see you next time.